You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with columnist at The Article, Ali Miraj, and political editor at The Sunday Mirror, Nigel Nelson. So let's uh, see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Run for your lives is the headline on the Metro alongside a picture of a woman and child running to take cover amid shelling in the city of Irpin. The Sun has the same picture with a similar headline. The Eye also leads on people running from airstrikes to save their lives. The Daily Mirror has a picture of a man escaping bombing with a child with the words, save them. The Daily Telegraph leads on the Prime Minister condemning Vladimir Putin's actions as barbaric after civilians attempting to flee the invasion of Ukraine were killed by Russian shells. Plea for safe passage, reports The Guardian, as the second attempt to hold a ceasefire fails. The Daily Express also reports on the failure of the ceasefire, calling it pure evil with no mercy for civilians as they flee. The Daily Mail quotes the UK's top military commander, Admiral Satoni Radikin, who has said Vladimir Putin could still lose the war in Ukraine after suffering losses to his forces. And the Financial Times reports on the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying that discussions are ongoing with Europe to ban oil imports from Russia. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we're joined tonight by the columnist at The Article, Ali Miraj, and political editor at The Sunday Mirror, Nigel Nelson. Welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us this evening. Let's start with the uh, Financial Times as we ran through there on the, the list of papers. Uh, and this possibility of a ban on oil imports from Russia. Nigel. Well, I mean, the, 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 this, is, this is one of the things they've been talking about for a while. And, of course, it's been Europe who've... Um, uh, who've been resisting this. Russia is providing 30, 35% of uh, Europe's energy needs. And so there's no question that if you start stopping Russian oil and gas coming in, uh, it's going to hurt, hurt Europe quite a lot. But um, it also represents half of all Russia's export revenue. So if sanctions are really going to bite, uh, then, we, then the rest of us have to bite the bullet. As far as Britain is concerned, it shouldn't affect us too much on the basis that uh, we take less than 4% uh, of our energy from Russia. So we wouldn't be hurt that badly, although we probably see a bit of a rise in, in our uh, home energy bills. But it's important now, if we're really going to try and put the noose around Russia's economy, it is very important that this key part of it is now addressed and we stop their supplies coming through. Ali, this, this definitely would step up the, the move in terms of, of crippling the, the Russian economy, wouldn't it? Well, I think a lot of measures have already been taken uh, uh, so far, uh, Gillian, over the last few days. The, the huge impact of uh, the exclusion of certain banks uh, from the SWIFT system, including a clampdown on the activities of the Russian Central Bank. I mean, they've got 643 billion of reserves abroad, which they can't convert into rubles. So the central bank is severely hampered, as well as various other uh, sanctions that have been brought in, a number of companies now leaving Russia. But to the point, this specific point around oil, uh, I think Nigel's right. It is about 35 to 40% of oil and gas uh, or energy uh, needs uh, for Europe, but it's higher than that for Germany. And the problem is that this strategy that the, the, the European countries have been pursuing of taking their eyes off the ball for the last few decades now of over-reliance on Russia for energy security issues is now coming to pass. And it's, it's easier said than done. It's fine for the US to let, lead the charge on this, but they're not dependent on Russian oil uh, to heat their homes or Russian gas, indeed. Uh, unfortunately, Europe are. It's certainly in the UK, uh, Nigel makes a valid point that we're not as exposed, but Europe is really, in my view, not particularly well equipped for this. Oil storage capacity is not sufficient. You've still got a necessity to heat homes until the spring uh, from Russian gas as well. And you've got, uh, at the moment, the oil price at $100 a barrel, above $100 a barrel. You've also got the gas price fivefold increase in the last year, it, it, potentially going to increase another 50%. And you've already got pain here that we're feeling 
with the um, the energy, uh, the price cap and the actions the Chancellor's taken to try and help families. Now, is the Chancellor going to have to help additional help on the back of these price increases? We'll have to see. It could, we could be seeing energy bills go up to £3,000 potentially here. So, it, look, it, it, it's an important step in the right direction, but I think it's easier said than done. Uh, Nigel, do you think Ali's right in that, that we are going to have to take a, a hit here ourselves? Obviously, uh, the, the move is to try and, and cripple the, the Russian economy, but, but we're also going to suffer in doing that. Yes, we are. And even though that, that, that there's only a sort of a small amount of it of, uh, of Russian energy coming into Britain. I mean, you're still looking at predictions of another um, thousand pounds on average on home energy bills. And on top of the rise that we've already got coming through, I mean, mine came through with a, uh, an extra thousand pounds already. It, we are that. that um, this is something that we're all going to have to deal with. Now, what is important is that the government uh, actually addresses the cost of living crisis on the basis that we all have to take a hit. It'll cost us as individuals to support Ukraine, but equally it must be a matter for businesses also uh, to shell out a bit and for the government to make things a little bit easier. They could do that with uh, scrapping, say, VAT, um, uh, on energy bills. I mean, there are, the, there are a number of, of measures they can take. But yes, it is going to be a bit painful. Uh, and uh, Ali, you mentioned some of the other moves um, to uh, actually get, get a grip on that uh, Russian economy and so that they feel some pain. We've broadcast tonight about Price Waterhouse Cooper withdrawing from Russia. VTB Bank uh, prepared to wind down its European operations as well. Um, and um, I think Burberry closing their three stores in, in Russia. Those sorts of moves, do you think that they are going to have the real impact and, and hit Russia where it hurts? Well, I do think they are going to have an impact. But the key thing, Gillian, is that there have been no real sanctions yet on the energy sector just to the point that we were just discussing. And the reason for that is, and there are also no sanctions on Spurbank, which is the largest uh, Russian bank, because these trades need to be settled uh, through a system. So Europe needs to pay for its energy, back to that old conundrum again. So this whole philosophy that particularly the Germans had for the last 30 years on their energy policy, which was uh, Vandal durch Handel, or, or change through trade, has failed. Uh, the Russians have not changed. Yes, these uh, sanctions are going to have an impact, but also bear in mind another thing, that since the invasion of Crimea in 2014, uh, Vladimir Putin has been trying to insulate his economy as best he can from interconnectedness with the world economy and to try and minimise the impact of sanctions. Now, he may not have uh, predicted that the sanctions would be as swift and as severe as they have been, but certainly he's been trying to uh, make his own economy more robust to that. Uh, and also, uh, if there are further sanctions to come, even in, if they are imposed in the energy sector, which I think is highly unlikely for the reasons I mentioned, a lot of that will go to China, potentially, that has got a voracious appetite uh, for energy. So, yes, I do think there is an impact. I think they've been swift. I think they've been wide-ranging, all very welcome. But I think Vladimir Putin's got the stomach for this to run and run. And I think just economic pain is not going to be sufficient enough for him to change course, but we'll have to see. Uh, Nigel, let's move on to the uh, Daily Mail, and they're quoting the UK Defence Chief, um, saying that uh, Putin's victory isn't inevitable. They've taken quite a, a hit, and his tactics thus far haven't, haven't been perhaps as successful as he thought they might be. Yes, this is Admiral Sir Tony Radikin, who's the, the, uh, the chief of the defence staff. So he's our um, Britain's top military man. And uh, I, I mean, this is actually quite a sort of hopeful idea that, in fact, that the Ukrainians might be able to resist. And what he's suggesting is they could even win, that um, the mail reports that um, uh, today eight Russian aircraft have been shot down, uh, which shows they don't have complete control of the sky. I mean, the only thing I would say is that um, I might be a bit of an armchair general rather than a real one. But just looking at this and looking at, the, uh, at it from a political point of view, the one thing I can't see is how um, uh, Vladimir Putin can actually lose. That having taken the decision to go into Ukraine, 
Britain, there is no way that he can really come out of it without victory. And so uh, it may be that we end, we end up with uh, more atrocities, that um, uh, he will use more extreme methods. But it does seem to be very difficult that he can actually, uh, he, he can in any way, pull away. And so on that basis, then, it's actually down to Putin himself. And really, um, the only way I can see that Ukraine can be saved is for Vladimir Putin to go. But that's a matter for uh, for the the the, um, uh, the Russian people, and more particularly the the military and the intelligence chiefs surrounding Putin at the moment. Uh, Ali, do you agree with with Nigel that um, seemingly at the moment there there is no way that uh, Putin can lose, or do you believe like um, that affecting something like a, a no fly zone could tip tip the balance? Well, look, I, I think, Julian, there's two points. Firstly, there's been a lot of reporting in the last 11 days or so that uh, things are not going according to plan for Vladimir Putin. Now, that may or may not be the case. I, I'm not convinced that it wholly is, actually. I mean, you're, he's trying to take over a country of 40 million people, and it's been little over a week. I mean, well, well, what do we expect? Uh, Putin has got the stomach for a very long fight here. So I think overplaying this and saying that uh, he's encountering resistance. Look, it's clear that uh, the Ukrainians are resisting, and President Zelensky is being very brave and courageous and leading his people in this fight, and they're all stepping up uh, and trying to resist, which we, we applaud and we understand. Um, but I think you, you are facing the, the might of a million-strong army with, a, with an air force and with, with munitions, uh, an arsenal of munitions, which is, is far outweighs Ukraine, even with Western support. So... I think the no-fly zone uh, issue, uh, Julian, has also been talked about. Zelensky's call for it again. And the argument being made by Zelensky is that the West, the West is saying it doesn't want to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, directly. Well, it's already involved in the war because it's supplying weapons to Ukraine. And that's something that Vladimir Putin himself has said, that by supplying weapons and by imposing economic sanctions, the West is already engaged in an act of war, which makes Zelensky's point for him. The reality, however, is that there is no appetite, and as Jens Stoltenberg, the General Secretary of NATO, came out again today and said this, there is no appetite on the part of Western powers in NATO to engage in a direct combat, potentially, with Russia, because that would lead to a conflagration which could in, in, involve multiple countries and thousands more lives being lost. So there is no appetite at the moment. What there is, however, is some discussion going on with the US to try and provide um, uh, air, air, new uh, airplanes to Poland so that Poland can give its old air airplanes, the MiGs, to the Ukrainian Air Force who know how to use them. There is a conversation apparently going on around that. OK, Ali and Nigel, for the moment, uh, thank you. We're going to take a break. Uh, coming up, more of tomorrow's front pages, including this in The Telegraph, barbaric Putin rains down terror. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, columnist at the article, Ali Miraj, and political editor at the Sunday Mirror, Nigel Nelson. Um, let's uh, kick this section off with uh, looking at the, the Metro um, and uh, the, the article, the front page there, pointing to the fact that Vladimir Putin is not uh, playing by the rules, despite his insistence that he isn't targeting civilians. The evidence is otherwise. Nigel. Yes, that's absolutely right. And I think that we, we've just been talking about sanctions and military strategy. But uh, this front page is actually showing uh, the most important thing of all, and that's the, the awful human cost of this war. So their main picture, which is repeated elsewhere in other papers, is of a, a, a mother and child fleeing Irpin. Uh, and it seems that, that uh, although the Russians keep saying that they're calling ceasefires, they don't actually uh, cease firing. So this is, this is where we're actually trying to remember the people who are suffering. Um, and that's why I think that we must keep the focus as much as possible on the Ukrainian people themselves and all they're actually going through. Uh, and the photo there of uh, actually um, of a family that, that's been struck down as they were trying to, to flee, quite distressing. Ali? Yeah, I mean, uh, Gillian, it's horrific. Uh, I mean, you've got a situation here where the, the norms of, uh, of, of, of battle are just being ignored. 
I mean, you, you normally would have a situation here which has been called for by the UN and others for humanitarian corridors to be established to get people out of centres like uh, Pin and Mariupol. And you've got a situation wherein within minutes of that uh, d decision being made about humanitarian corridors, you have people being killed, uh, and including kids. And it's absolutely heart-wrenching to see that. And then you've also got 1.5 million people on the move right now. The, uh, the head of the uh, UN Commission on Refugees is saying this is the biggest movement uh, since the end of the Second World War. A lot of those people are going to Poland and to neighboring countries. Uh, and you see uh, on the other side of humanity, the good side of humanity, where Poles, who, by the way, have taken a lot of criticism in recent years for not being that welcoming to migrants, particularly from certain parts of the Middle East, are now opening their homes, going, going to the border to collect people with their own hands and invite them into their homes and take care of them. That is the positive side of humanity in all of this. Yes, and Poland saying tonight, actually, that number's increased to, to a million. They've uh, confirmed they've taken... Uh, into the, the country. In The Telegraph, moving on, Nigel, um, Boris Johnson's quoted as saying that uh, Putin has launched a sordid campaign of, of war crimes against Ukrainian civilians. That is what is happening, isn't it? War crimes are being committed. Well, that's what we're that's what we're seeing uh, seeing on your on all your sort of news broadcasts at the moment. That yes, that's exactly what's going on. And one of the things the Telegraph is pointing out is that lawyers for the International Criminal Court and the United Nations they reckon they now have have evidence of thousands of war crimes. And we're only eleven days eleven days into this war. The question, of course, is um, who will actually pay for that? That there's obviously no way of getting. Uh, Putin to The Hague to actually answer uh, for this uh, unless he's deposed. So uh, it's important to collect the evidence. It's important to make the accusations. What at the end of all this, and let's hope that the end is coming soon Indeed. rather than rather later. Nigel, we must leave it there. Thank you. See you in the next hour, both.